Um, but up on the screen, you'll notice I have this picture of this GPS uh, from an old car. In fact, it's actually from a 2005 Lexus. And this is about the same year that a neighbor of mine, I forgot what reason it was that he picked me up and we were going somewhere. He lives two doors over. And, but he, had, uh, he was a business owner and he owned uh, a 2005 Lexus. It was beautiful. It was black. It was nice. It was nice, new, shiny. And of course, I don't think I had been in a car up till that point because they started putting these things in cars in 1998. And I don't think I, I, I've, I saw them in magazines and things like that. And they were becoming popular. Now we've got them on our phones, on our shoes, on our belt. They're everywhere. But I was, you know, I love technology. And, and when I saw that, he was telling me, and I said, tell me all about this. And he says, well, it's terrific. You could plug in the destination you want to go to, and this thing will guide you across the city. I said, do it. Put it in there. And so he clicks the button, and, uh, and that's exactly what it looked like. And I was just, just mesmerized by it. I said, that is fascinating. He says, yeah, it connects with a satellite. And uh, I said, oh, man, that is so awesome. And the thing about a GPS, and I want to put this on the screen, a GPS not only shows you where you are at at the very moment, that very moment, it tells you how to get to your desired destination. And today, what I would like us all to do is for a few moments, take a look at God's GPS, which of course is scripture. This series this month is on scripture, okay? Take a look at God's GPS. This spiritual and divine GPS will get you and I down the road of life successfully and help us to get to our destination, which is, what do we all want? We all want our lives to bring glory and honor to God. That's what we want. We want to bring honor and glory to God. And so, of course, the topic I'm talking about, I alluded to it earlier, is this idea of illumination. Illumination of Scripture, the illumination of God's Word. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to define that for you. We're going to talk to you about the benefits of that. But first, of course, let's go to the Lord in prayer because without him, we can do nothing. So let's bow for prayer, everyone. Father, we take a moment this morning and we come to your throne of grace. Lord, thank you for the throne of grace. You sit in throne, Father, and you have uh, been overseeing our lives, this world, everything that occurs to this very moment. And Lord, we come to you for grace to help in time of need. We just pray that you'll strengthen us, Lord, for this task. And may we leave here, Lord, better because we've looked into your word carefully and we have taken it into our lives. And we ask this in your precious name, Lord Jesus, and for your sake. Amen. Well, if you ever turn to Psalm 119, you'll remember it because... If you think you're going to read one chapter that day, that, that is 176 verses long. And 174 of the 176 verses, all but two have uh, the Word of God embedded in them. Isn't that amazing? 174 verses out of 176 have a reference to God's Word. And it's so incredible. Uh, the psalmist was a child of God that didn't want to just read God's word. And you know what? We ought to read God's word, okay, on a regular basis. You may not do it every day, but if you can and get faithful doing that, it's just to your betterment. But you know what? Don't, we don't want to just open it up and read it. We want God to make it come alive to us in our minds and our hearts, so crucial. And I want you to hear the cry of this psalmist's heart. Okay, look at Psalm 119 and 12. It should be in your notes, but you can look on the screen here. Blessed are you, O Lord. I praise you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. 
You know what? Wouldn't that be an awesome prayer to pray every time you open the Bible? Lord, teach me your word. Lord, I need to understand it. Verse 18, six verses down. Lord, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Open my eyes, Lord. I, this is difficult, Lord. This is a little bit hard. Help me to understand this. Go down in that same chapter to verse 33 and verse 34. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. So, Psalm 119 is a fantastic picture of the kind of hunger, the kind of hunger that every one of us should have to be illuminated. You know what? I think it's something, if you're not doing it already, it's, it would be great for you to add on to your daily routine in the sense of you approach God's word and say, Lord, you know what? It's not enough just to look at words. I need you, Holy Spirit of God, to teach me and to illuminate my mind and to help me understand this, okay? You get the idea. So let's begin by nailing down the meaning of illumination. So this number one is illumination defined, okay? We're going to define it, okay? Schaefer said illumination is that influence or ministry of the Holy Spirit which enables all who are in right relation with God to understand the scriptures. Okay, so he's the helper, isn't he? He's the paraclete, the Bible calls him. The one who's called alongside of us. And what the Holy Spirit does is helps us. He takes away the blinders, as it were, and helps us to understand what we're reading. Now, he's not going to do everything for us. He's there to assist us. I mean, like, for instance... If, if we don't want to, um, to do the important work we need to do, like we may need to look words up in a dictionary and things, you know, we need, he's not going to do our work for us, but he is the one who's going to illuminate us and help us, okay? Uh, Tony Evans, he said, illumination is the work of the Holy Spirit, that opens up believers' minds to the Word of God, enabling them to understand the meaning, and Evans adds, the personal application. How do we live this out? How do we put this into practice? The personal application of divine revelation. So he's saying, as we're down here on earth, working our way through Scripture, the Spirit of God is, well, he lives within us, but he's up in heaven, and he's also living within us, and he's helping us along. He's the, our helper. Okay, and he's not going to read scripture for us and he's not going to pray for us in the sense that we need to pray and ask God for illumination. Another scholar said illumination is the work of the Holy Spirit that, oh, I'm sorry, illumination is the work of the Holy Spirit that opens one's spiritual eyes to comprehend the meaning of the word of God. So you get the idea. And even though our Lord Jesus Christ isn't in person to sit down with us, wouldn't that be great? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> to have him there and say, Lord, what does that mean? I mean, that would be awesome. But that's not the way God chose to do things for us. You know, he chose for us to do our work, and he chose for the Spirit of God to do his work. But our Lord's not with us in person. However, probably the closest that you and I are going to get to a direct definition of illumination in scripture is there in Luke 24 45 Jesus is on the road to Emmaus with the two disciples and it says they're completely dumbfounded by his by 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 the the savior by Jesus's death and they don't get it they don't understand they said we thought this is the one who is going to save all of Israel but Jesus opens their understanding you see that that they might comprehend the scripture. So that's illumination defined. Number two, illumination distinguished. We have to make a difference here. We've got to distinguish illumination from revelation of scripture and the inspiration of scripture. I love what Tony Evans put here. Okay, whoop, I went too far. 
Revelation, Tony says, Tony Evans, is what God has said about himself. Okay, so in Scripture, God reveals what he's like, what he thinks, how you and I can get to heaven when we die. He's made a revelation and says, this is the truth. Or in the Old Testament, thus saith the Lord. This is what the Lord says. So he's revealing. Revelation is what God has said about himself. This inspiration, you'll remember last week, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture is God-breathed. So inspiration is the recording of what God said. So holy men of old spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Okay, So they took and they spoke those words. They wrote the scriptures down in the original writings, and they were God's word in perfection. That is uh, inspiration. And then finally, illumination is the process by which God's revelation of himself ceases to be just words on a page and comes alive in our hearts and minds. Man, that's what we need, everybody. You know, as good as it is, and I know there's a lot of, a lot of believers on earth that sit down and Daily, they open the Bible and they read it. But sometimes, those same Christians are kind of like, okay, I read my, my two chapters in the book of uh, Psalms. I read my one chapter in Proverbs. And I read my one chapter in the New Testament. And so, uh, I'm done for the day. But you know what? That's not illumination. I mean, it can be. But it's a little bit better than that. It's a little bit deeper than that. It's... You know, like I said, starting off and saying, Lord, I sure would like to see wondrous things in your word. So, okay, you get the idea. And I want you to note that without revelation and inspiration, without those second two, without revelation and inspiration, we would have no Bible. And without illumination, we would have no understanding of the Bible. So that's why all of these are crucial, okay? Now, I want to talk about a misconception about illumination. And this is huge. I mean, there are so many Christians that are just, they're in the dark about this. They don't understand the Holy Spirit. They don't understand illumination. And they think that the Holy Spirit is going to tell them what to do in their life automatically. Now, again, this would be just as wonderful as having Jesus sitting there when you're studying the Bible. Because you could be studying it, and you come across a very difficult little passage, and you could turn to him and say, Jesus, can you help me here? Sure. And he tells us what it is. Well, wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to study the Bible? We didn't have to learn the Bible. You didn't have to come to church and hear it preached. Man, if God gave us a direct pipeline from the Holy Spirit of God to our brains, and we were just going down the, the street, and we so thought about something, we said, Lord, what should I do about this? <sighs> All right, here you go. I want you to do this, and then I want you to do that, and then finally do this. Oh, thank you, Lord. Wouldn't it be great if that, well, that, you know, that's not the way it works. And you know what? These people are taught to just run by what, they, what we would call uh, impressions. But impressions are not, are not uh, what we run by, everybody. We run by scripture. Now, we all get impressions, okay? We all get impressions. But you know what? God's word is the last word. Our impressions may not be biblical at all. And that's why, that's why you have videos on YouTube of preachers, you know, sitting there bragging I'm so close to God that I just became a billionaire. And they talk about how many Learjets they've got and things like that. And, you know, the Holy Spirit told me. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, my goodness. I mean, you know why a bolt of lightning doesn't come down and just crack the person's skull from top to bottom? I don't know. It used to happen the ground would open up and swallow people, but... God's doing things different, a little differently than he did back then. But anyway, um, just listening for an inner voice and waiting for direction from God is not how we operate. 
okay? We operate on the basis of God's word. Remember I taught you on the Holy Spirit? I said you got, you got black and white in the Bible, right and wrong, okay? It's in print. It's in black and white. So you've got those things are sure things. That's absolute truth. Do not lie. Do not steal. Do not commit adultery. Do not uh, covet, blah, blah, blah. Those things are set in stone. They're for all people everywhere at all times. That's absolute truth. But then what about things where it's your call? Where am I going to go to college? What, what vocation should I take up? That's where we need wisdom. And, you know, we can ask God to get wisdom to us. It doesn't mean, again, ask God for wisdom. Bing! Ah! No, he doesn't, he doesn't send it down into your brain. What he does is, okay, I'll give you wisdom. Okay, go to your leaders. Go to uh, a trusted friend. Go get, get wisdom. from all. Get, get it from many wise people. Take it in. And then through that, God's going to give you wisdom to make a good decision. It's not a, not a right and wrong decision. It's a decision about things that don't deal with right and wrong. In other words, it, it, it deals with day-to-day uh, -day life in the sense of, you know, these things that the Bible doesn't tell us. You know, go to this college, take this vocation, marry this person, okay? Those are wisdom issues. They're not right and wrong. And, you know, if this had been taught from pulpits for the last 400 years, we could have saved a lot of brides at the altar crying, or not at the altar, but like in the back room where they're getting dressed, crying their eyes out because they were taught, there's one person for you. The pastors say this, there's one person for you, and if you miss it, tough luck, you're stuck with second or third best for the rest of your life. That's horrible because they're sitting there in the room and they're crying and they're like, I just don't know if this is the perfect. Okay, you know, there isn't no, any perfect one. God may say, hey, here's five excellent ones. Take your pick. Get wisdom, you know, date them. See which ones, you know, which ones on the up and up and which ones are, you know, they're like a... Anyway, so you get the idea, all right? So uh, this idea that the Holy Spirit to listen for this inner voice, it just doesn't hold water biblically. If you need information about a right or wrong issue, it's in the Bible. If you need information about things that are uh, not right and wrong but are then important, you can get wisdom. You can get wisdom. You can get wisdom from Scripture as well. I mean, it talks about things and it gives principles that will guide you. And then you can get wisdom from people that know Scripture well. And so that is what we need to do. And like I said, if we had the Holy Spirit talking to us right into our brains and telling everything we need to do, listen, we wouldn't need the Bible. We wouldn't need to study it. There'd be no need for it. But God clearly, clearly tells us this. Be diligent. Okay, do you know what that is? Diligent? Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. By the way, uh, this is implying that some are going to stand before Jesus one day. They'll be with him forever. They'll be, they'll be in his presence forever because they've been saved by grace. But they might be ashamed. And Jesus, uh, or John the Apostle said, little children, stay close to him that you can have confidence and not be ashamed at his coming. 1 John 2.28 Okay, so we need to be diligent in the word, okay? Not listen for some voice, but be diligent in God's word to present yourself approved, okay? You want to be approved, okay? Dakamas, not adakamas, which is disapproved in Greek, okay? You want to be approved when you stand before God. You want to be a worker who does not need to be ashamed Notice, rightly, uh, rightly dividing the word of truth, cutting a straight line with God's word, okay? So the idea, I think the idea there, if I'm remembering correctly, is plowing the ground and it's dividing a nice, you know, do you want, if you're a farmer, do you want your lines to go all over the place? No, you want to rightly divide the ground, so just perfect rows, and God says, that's what I want you to do in the Word. I want you to be accurate. I want you to be like the Bereans, more noble than those in Thessalonica, because they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether what Paul said was true. 
Okay, that's the word. that's diligence. Okay, you know. Let me ask you this: Would you want to you want to go get surgery from a doctor who's never studied medicine in a book? You know, he went, got a degree, never opened a book, and he says, "Well, I just listened to a voice in my head about how to do your surgery." You, what? <laughs> Or, how about an auto mechanic? Yeah, I really never studied or trained it, and I repair cars by just listening to how I should do it in my head, and my brain tells me how to do it. You wouldn't get your car repaired there. You know, you'd, you'd, you'd get there and start it up, and then you, it wouldn't start because he took out all the cylinders. You know, there's no cylinders in the car, and it doesn't run. And neither would you want a preacher or a pastor who never studied God's Word. And he says, well, you know what, I'm so close to God and the Holy Spirit, I just, I just have the Holy Spirit tell me what to preach. Okay, that isn't going to fly. We need to be diligent in God's word, okay? And so why would, be, why would we aspire to be Christians who say something like, well, I don't study, I just let the Spirit lead me. That, that sounds spiritual. Oh, wow, you let the Spirit lead you. Whoa, you know, that must be, yeah, but it's not spiritual. Okay. Now, we do want to walk in harmony with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, but this idea of a voice and just listening to that, now, I'm not, hey, I would su suspect that there's sometimes you get a voice in your head about these non-right and wrong issues, and, you know, it may be correct. Okay, so I'm not saying that every impression is of the devil and is wrong, but what I'm saying is if that's what you're counting on, uh, you're not doing it God's way. Notice this. Notice this in Psalm 119 again. The entrance of your words gives light. Huh? Light. Illumination. The lights are turning on. Okay? It gives understanding to the simple. And of course, you know this word simple. Uh, this is the, a word in the Proverbs that means naive. What does that mean? Ah. It's kind of like you're not fully mature yet. You know, when we're young, we're naive, we do stupid things, you know, crazy things. I just told the story recently when we were kids, we would, we, you know, I wasn't saved when I was a kid. And so when we were like 12 or 13, we decided we're going to go around the streets of my city and we're going to see who can collect the most different kinds of empty beer cans. And we could see how many we can get. Like, you know, can you get 20? Can you get 30? Well, this one kid in our neighborhood came and he was taunting us because he had this can and he was, ha ha, you, none of you have this. And so we immediately, the four of us, surrounded him and said, you're not going to have it either. And so we got it out of his hands and we were tossing it to one another and he'd run over to them and he'd toss it to me and I'd flip it over to the other. And so finally we threw it up on the roof of the neighbor's garage and it rolled down into the gutter. So that kid wanted that beer can, so he got up on a garbage can, and he stood on top of the garbage can, and he reached up, he was kind of tall, and he got it out of there, and he says, ha! And he jumps down, and there's a two-by-four with a nail sticking, and it came through the top of his shoe. <laughs> and so, sometimes we're naive, everyone, and so first, that guy's blood drained out of his face, and then the rest of ours drained out of our faces, you know, and so anyway, but, you know, thank God his mom and dad never came around and, because he could have told them, you know, who made you jump down off the, you know. But thank God we didn't get any trouble for that. Whew. So, anyway. Now, let me just say this, everybody. If a believer, or if you, or if I, if we ever get stuck in, in our uh, study of God's word, if we ever get to the place where, like, man, I'm just getting nothing out of God's word. And by the way, uh, if you're reading, like, Leviticus or Numbers or the end of Joshua where it's saying, you know, uh, and there were this many people in this tribe and they had it, 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 and this person begot this person and, and, the, and it goes on for like seven chapters, you know, you're sitting there like ding, 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 and, and some of those things are hard and you're like, you're like, why in the world did this get put in the Bible? But there's good reasons for it and people write commentaries on those entire books on every verse about why God did and you find out and you're like, oh yeah, that's really great. But anyway, but sometimes we get stuck not because it's a little bit more difficult or foreign to us, but um, this James 121, I broke it down into two verses here, or two parts. But James says to us, 
lay aside. See, he's talking about the Word of God here, which is able to save your souls. Not a great translation there. It means which is able to rescue your lives. This Word of God, if you're here spiritually, it can rescue you and move you over here. If you're in, you're in a terrible spot, and man, and you're just having so many troubles, God's Word can get you out of there and rescue you. That's, that's save there is rescue your psuche, your lives. God wants our lives to be rescued through the Word. How? Well, first, if we're clogged up on the inside spiritually with gunk, junk, bad thinking, get rid of it. Lay aside the filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Wow, that's a lot, overflowing. Yeah, okay. And secondly, receive with meekness the implanted word. That's the a word that means it's down in you from God. It's, in, it's innate in the sense that you've been saved and God is dwelling in you and it's, it's like the, a real part of you. Now, you've got to learn it too, but it, it becomes part of you at, at uh, salvation at the time, the moment you're regenerated. Receive with meekness. We've got to lay aside and receive it. Okay, get rid of the garbage and then on purpose receive humbly the word of God which is able to rescue your lives. Okay, sometimes we get stuck in the mud and uh, the wheels are spinning spiritually. We're not doing well in God's word. In fact, Peter, the apostle, said to new believers, lay aside all malice. Look at, look at all this garbage that new believers have stuck inside of them. Lay aside malice, hatefulness. All lying, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. As newborn babes desire, there's what we need to be doing, desire the pure milk of the word. See, a, a new Christian needs the easy parts of the Bible. Okay, Desire the pure milk of the word, not the meat, the milk, that you may grow thereby. But eventually, it shouldn't take too long. Doesn't take, like, like, not like with a baby, you get more mature quicker than a baby. You should get more mature much faster and get to the meat of the word much quicker. Okay, two more and we're done. Number four, okay, number four. Why we need illumination, okay? And here's why. There's a way that seems right to a man. The first reason we need it, human wisdom. If you listen to the people around you and they're not students of God's word, most of the time it's going to lead to the pathway to misery and an early grave. Look at this. If you listen to them long enough and hard enough, there is a way, there's a path in life to take that seems right to someone, to a person. But its end is the way of death. It's like walking off a cliff at night when you don't realize a cliff is there. You're just out for a walk and it's so dark. And that's what God says, you know what? Uh, human wisdom is the pathway to misery and an early grave, okay? What we need down here is God's wisdom, not human wisdom. Secondly, if we don't understand the Bible, this is so important. If we don't understand the Bible, it's going to be impossible for us to live according to the Bible, right? <laughs> How can you live by the Bible if you don't understand it, you know? Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Oh, I don't know what that means. <laughs> okay, you need, we need to understand the Bible, and God will help us, and so will our Bible fellowship teachers, spiritual leaders, and so forth. Okay, so that's number four, why we need it. First reason, you'll end up in a terrible place without it, and second reason, you can't live what you don't understand. Okay, finally, number five. Lots of points today. The benefits of illumination. You know, I love that. Here's a scripture and here's some uh, notes here. Okay? You know, um, I've told you the story, I believe, that, uh, and I'm almost positive I have, but, you know, I was a party animal, you know, when I was a teenager going to these parties to get drunk every Friday night and every Saturday night and, you know, just sitting around and laughing and then dragging your friend into the back seat of the car because 
they're so drunk they, they've passed out in the front yard and you're throwing them in the car, you're throwing them in the trunk, and then you're throwing them in his front yard once you get home and you take off and leave them there laying in the front yard so he can get, get up in the middle of the night at some point. And um, anyway, it was an awful time in my life. But you know what? After I came to the Lord Jesus when I was nearly 19, the summer of my 18th year, I came to the Lord and then I turned 19 later that year. You know what? For a little while, I went back to those. I remember taking, for a little while, six packs of uh, Pepsi. And they would make, laugh at me, and they'd say, man, you're not going to keep on going with this Christian stuff, are you? i say, yeah, I think so. And they're like, oh, man, man, they just want to take all the fun away, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, they're going down this list. And I said, well, I don't know. I don't care about what you do, but I know what I'm going to do. I think I'm going to stick with it. But then finally I just stopped going because it was detrimental to my spiritual health. So then I came across uh, Warren Wearsby. I came across a set of uh, six cassette tapes on First Peter by Warren Wearsby. Boy, thank you, Lord. You know, I'm so glad I got that and not six cassette tapes by Kenneth Copeland on how to earn a billion dollars and get Learjets. Anyway, so anyway, Warren Wearsby did First Peter one through five each night at a church in California and man was it rich and I remember sitting down in my mom and dad's basement we had this big huge door and I turned it into a desk I put it down against the wall and I don't know what I used to prop it up I might have taken apart a crummy old table and screwed the legs of that table onto that big door it was like about at about I don't know like 40 inches across and you know eight feet long I had a beautiful desk down there and uh and I just put the books out there and the cassette player, and man, I would take notes. And every Friday night, instead of going to these parties from, you know, six, seven o'clock till three in the morning, I would sit in there and study God's word hour after hour, and man, it was rich. It was rich. The benefits of illumination. On the Emmaus Road, I want to show you another one show you another one. And I can relate to this because uh, not only back then when I was a new believer, but even now, man, there's just some times where you're in God's word and it's awesome. And here's the scripture. On the Emmaus road, Jesus taught them from God's word about the Messiah, about himself in the Old Testament. And those two men, after Jesus revealed that revealed himself that it was Jesus sitting at their table and then he disappeared out of their sight. They said, did not our hearts burn within us? That's a benefit of illumination. Did not our hearts burn within us while, we, while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? See, they knew those scriptures, but they didn't understand them. They knew them. They, they, were, they memorized them growing up. A lot of those people memorized the entire Old Testament. Can you imagine? I mean, I think I, I, I get real excited that I memorized like a thousand verses at one time. Try memorizing the whole Old Testament. Oh, my goodness. But they did it. But they, they started when they were three years old, you know. But anyway, um, but they knew the verses. But they said, man, didn't our hearts burn within us as he was illuminating us, as he was talking to us on a way, and he opened the scripture. So as we close, I got the application here, everybody. The application and then a, one more story. I want to just ask you a question before we go because this is what we're going to take this home and we're going to put this, we're going to apply this in our lives. Question, are you using God's GPS, the global positioning system, you know, here's the destination God wants you to get to. And of course, as we have often talked about, glorification of God, well done, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a little, I'll make you ruler over much. Enter into the joy. That's the goal, okay, to bring eternal glory to God through our, you know, our, often, our lives that are often failing. We have to persevere. Just man falls seven times, gets back up. Hey, you're not going to go forever. Like, you're not going to go for weeks and never sin. You know, you're going to sin, fall down, you got to get up. Fall down, get up. Sometimes it might be really bad, but you still got to get up and keep going. 
Because God's inter- interested in where you're going and not where you've been. He's interested in how you're going to finish, if you're going to finish as a victorious person, okay? So another question here on this application. We talked about it earlier. Are you praying like the psalmist prayed? Okay? Are you praying like the psalmist prayed? Lord, open my eyes. Those kind of prayers. Start doing that. Start doing that. God, man, that's God's will. Hey, is, listen, is it God's will for you to have illumination of the word? Yes. So if you pray for something that's God's will, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, and we have the, the request that we made of him. Wow, we're going to get it. Isn't that exciting? You, this is according to God's will, so he's going to give you illumination. Wow. Okay? Okay? Hopefully you don't feel like you're wise enough at this point in life. I don't need God's word anymore. I don't need it. I don't need, the, I don't need church. I don't need church. I don't need other Christians. I can live like a hermit, like a monk. You know, it's no wonder that these people, that religious leaders that turn from God's word, they end up like the most immoral people on earth. Why? Because they do everything that God says not to do. They, 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 like, they put themselves in, in monasteries and like there's times where they don't interact with people forever. They take a vow of silence. I'm not going to talk for a year. You know, it's like the one monk, this one guy said, hey, you know what, I'm going to take a vow of silence. And, and so, but uh, every year, he said, I'm going to take a vow of silence for three years. And every year he would get to say uh, two words every, every year to his superior. And so after the first year of silence, he was brought in and he said to his superior, he says, okay, what, are, what, what do you have to say this year? He says, room cold. <laughs> and then he went for another year with, uh, without... Uh, without any uh, saying anything, and then they brought him in after two years, and he said, okay, go ahead, you got your two words to say. He said, food bad. <laughs> <laughs> and then he gets to the end, and, and he, he gets, you know, three years, and he's able to say his two words after the third year. And he said uh, uh, something like, uh, clothes itchy. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm sorry, I, I had to, okay. He says, I quit. That was his two words. I quit. And the superior says, well, it doesn't surprise me. You've done nothing but complain all the whole time you were here. <laughs> Whew, I, D- Jamie, I dug myself out of that one. I always do that. I try to do these jokes from memory that I haven't done in 15 years. You know, I can't remember. So, I quit. <laughs> Closing story. Closing story. Okay. Tim Keller, he said, I used to go to visit my brother-in-law, and he would never wear a seat belt in the car. Never. I always berated him for it. I remember one time he picked me up at the airport, and voila, he had on his seat belt and his shoulder harness. I said, what happened? What changed you? He says, I'll tell you. He said, I went to visit a friend of mine in the hospital who was in an accident, and he didn't have a seatbelt on, and he went through the windshield, and when I went to visit him, he had about two to three hundred stitches in his face. He said, I said to myself, I better wear my seatbelt. And he said, we talked about that a little bit, and he said, did you not know Did you not know that if you don't wear your seatbelt and you go through the windshield, you're going to go through the windshield if you have an accident? And he said, and this is what he said, I'll put it on the screen. He said, of course I knew it. When I went to the hospital to see my friend, I got no new information. But the information I had became new. The information got real to my heart and finally sank down and affected the way I live. Boom. An example of illumination. And so, folks, listen. We've got God's word. And th- those of you that are joining us on the stream, we need to not... Okay, 
If you're not reading God's word right now, faithfully, then that's something that you'll want to do. So you need to change into a person who will persevere until it just becomes regular with you, okay? And again, I didn't say, I didn't say monotonous or something like that. I said something that becomes part of you, okay? And then um, we want to do that, and also we want to be people that are praying over the word. Once you get reading, you want to say, I, I don't want to just read it. I want to know it. I want it to become part of me. And then you ask God according to his will, and you'll get in God's good time. It's not like you'll become a Bible scholar overnight, but in God's good time, you'll become a wise person, a wise mother, a wise father, a wise parent, a wise husband or wife. And that's glorious. It's glorious. So everybody, let's just bow for prayer today. And with our heads bowed and eyes closed, just think about these things. Maybe you've got gunk in your side of you spiritually, malice, hypocrisy, envy, all evil speaking, and you need to get that out. Maybe uh, you need to receive with humility the implanted word which is able to rescue you, rescue your lives from worthlessness, rescue your lives from boredom, rescue your lives from monotony, Rescue your lives from sadness and loneliness. God's word can do that. Father, thank you for your word, Lord. Oh, the Psalms, Lord, and the psalmist. God, let that be part of our lives. Uh, teach me, O oh Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I will keep it unto the end. Give me understanding, and I will keep your law. Indeed, I will observe it with my whole heart. Lord, let that be the cry of our hearts for understanding, for wisdom, for illumination from the Spirit of God. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. If you haven't had a chance to look at Glenn's uh, table here that his daughter set up, this is things that Glenn loved in his life. We want to give you the opportunity to do that now. You're dismissed. Have a wonderful week, everybody. God bless.